To travel by train along the Settle and Carlisle line is to experience one of the wonders of the railway world. Passing along England's wild Pennine backbone, there's plenty to see and discover. Not just scenery and steam trains, but rich heritage of castles and houses, and a chance to see eagles and hawks fly free, with the scenery below ground just as beautiful as that above. And there's also a whole lot more. We begin in the market town of Settle, in the county of North Yorkshire. The best views of Settle are from Castleburg Rock. Towering high above the town, this is also an ideal place to watch the trains come and go. Settle sits on the Mid Craven Fault, which marks the southern geological boundary of the Yorkshire Dales. The town has always been an important trading centre. Its first market charter was granted back in 1249. The marketplace is fronted by a number of interesting buildings, including the Shambles and the enigmatic Naked Man Cafe. The fellow himself was carved out in relief in the stonework supposedly to ridicule the frivolous fashions of the late 17th century. Today, Settle is full of the charming shops and cafes which have long since disappeared from more modern town centres. At the end of Chapel Street is another delightful old building. Although only built in Victorian times, its fine mock Tudor frontage is entirely convincing. Nearby the Museum of North Craven Life is the ideal place to start our exploration of the area. The museum explains the landscape and settlement of the Dales when pack horses were the only means of transport. Other displays include the domestic and working life of the Dalesman. The museum also tells a story of the Settle and Carlisle Railway with a fine collection of photographs of the line and the locomotives which were tested on it. A number of relics from the days of the Midland Railway Company have also been preserved here. Settle Church has also connections with the Settle and Carlisle Railway. Inside the porch, a marble memorial commemorating those killed during the construction of the line. The tombstone of a young Welsh navvy is in the little cemetery. A short walk back through the town brings us to Watershed Mill, home of the Dales Maid Centre. This 1820s cotton mill has been fully restored and now houses a collection of products made entirely in the Dales. From clocks to books, 
sculpture, pottery, furniture, food and fashion, the centre stocks it all. Regular demonstrations are staged at the centre, showing the techniques used in creating Dale's made products. I'm doing these plastic, no, I'm doing plastic boxes, uh, and I'm lining them because, you know, I've got this lining ready to, that will go into there. Makes a little box like, similar to that. My daughter's made them with... Yes, it is labour intensive, but on the other hand, I... Yes, yes. Well, there were four of them in that series. I've done the original. High above Settle is Atomire Scar and the famous Victoria Cave. Excavation of these caves yielded the remains of bison, rhinoceros, elephant and bears, as well as a number of human artefacts which are in the museum. Leaving Settle, we head north for the Ribblesdale villages of Stainforth, Horton and Selside. Near the village of Stainforth, is a fine pack horse bridge across the river. Here the valley is crisscrossed with stepping stones, trees and waterfalls, and Stainforth Force must be one of the best places to spend the hot, sunny afternoon. A little further up the valley, the Pennine Way runs down to Horton in Ribblesdale from the dark ridge of Penny Ghent. Beyond Horton, the valley becomes less wooded and the wild beauty of the northern Pennines begins to unfold. We're now in limestone country, soluble rock which is full of caves and potholes. Most of these are only accessible to well-equipped cavers, but alum pot will charm even the unambitious walker. This awe-inspiring vertical shaft is over 300 feet deep, with alum pot back plunging in from the moor above. With the threat of line closure lifted, the station at Ribblehead has recently been reopened. Ribblehead is over a thousand feet above sea level, and from here, all of the famous three peaks of Yorkshire, Penny Ghent, Ingleborough, and Wernside are visible. Ribblehead Viaduct is one of Britain's most impressive works of railway engineering. 24 arches, 100 feet high and 440 yards long. This was the last great viaduct to be built entirely by hand. During construction in the 1870s, Batty Moss was home to as many as 3,000 people who lived in a vast shanty town of huts, rough shelters and tents.
what should have taken three years took seven, and Ribblehead may well have been the worst job any of those navvies had ever worked on. A hundred and eight men died building this one viaduct, and the churchyard at Chapel the Dale had to be extended. Today, the moss is home only to the occasional camper. Not far from Ribblehead, on the road to Ingleton, are the White Scar Caves and Britain's biggest tourist cavern. Extending for almost a mile under the limestone escarpment of Ingleborough, they're a fascinating introduction to the underground world. Well, White Scar Caves is a natural cave in the limestone region of, under the hill of Ingleborough, formed naturally by the water erosion over numerous thousands of years, literally taking place through various ice ages to today, and with the water erosion, with water basically, sorry, coming through the cave, we still have erosion taking place. So we have literally a live cave system for everyone to come along and enjoy. The most numerous formations you'll see in the cave system are the very thin, delicate straw stalactites, which hang down from the ceiling, growing anything from inches to a couple of feet in length. On top of that, you have the stalagmites and the stalactites also taking place, the stalagmitic columns or pillars. And at the very end of your tour, you will actually visit what is the largest open chamber for the public to visit while they're anywhere in this country underground, known as the battlefield chamber. The caves were discovered in 1923 by a Cambridge undergraduate who negotiated the then tight entrance with candles stuck in the brim of his hat. Today's visitors are treated to a guide, a hard hat and flood-lit passages. <laughs> The cave entrance is an excellent example of geological structure, with an ancient sea floor resting beneath rock, which was deposited millions of years later from myriads of tiny marine animals. White scar is still being carved out from the rock by the river which flows along it. Nowhere is this more dramatically illustrated than where we first meet the stream. Further on, the path has been laid over a more gentle stream bed and cave formation, with evocative names like the Sword of Damocles, the Devil's Tongue and Aram Lily are common. Finally, we arrive at the end of the cave and a newly blasted tunnel brings us out into the battlefield cavern. This massive chamber, over 90 meters long, takes its name from the chaos of boulders strewn across the floor. It was discovered in 1971 by cavers who literally dug their way upwards through the treacherous, slippery and unstable boulder choke.
The roof had great voids or avens which soared into mysterious darkness and thousands of delicate straw stalactites hung in great curtains. These ancient dried mud pools are possibly 90,000 years old and are just one of the features that cause these caves to be designated part of a site of special scientific interest. Ribblehead, we continue our journey north over the mighty viaduct and on to Blee Moor. Blee Moor signal box, reputed to be the loneliest in England, is still very much in service but the water tower which once kept it company now survives only in photographs. From here we pass into Cumbria, stopping at Dent, the highest mainline station in England. The station, set high on the Pennine Ridge, is over four miles from the town of Dent, but the views are spectacular and the walk down the valley is one of the best in the Dales. Well, not far from the station we can watch the trains cross the magnificent Artengill Viaduct. The beautiful village of Dent, with its whitewashed houses and cobbled streets, is well worth a visit. Its sturdy old buildings reflect Dent's former importance in the Dales. There is a memorial fountain in the center of the main street, which commemorates the life and work of Professor Adam Sedgwick, one of the founders of geology and one of the greatest scientific personalities of his day. He was also a lifelong benefactor of his native Dale. Dent also has a fine old church and the grave of George Hodgson, complete with a stake hole as a reminder of the legend of the Dent vampire. Despite the legend, Dentdale is a friendly and warm village, a favourite with visitors and Dale's folk alike. Our next stop is at Garsdale, once the junction for the branch line to Hawes. Here we take a trip back in time to the winter of 1988 to watch the removal of the legendary Garsdale turntable.
steam locomotives which assisted trains up the long incline used to be turned here and prepared for their next duty. In the early hours of a December day in 1900, a locomotive being turned in the teeth of a howling gale was spun around like a top. It took the combined efforts of firemen, driver and helpers over an hour to bring the turntable under control. With the passing of the age of steam, the turntable became redundant and was bought by the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway for use on their preserved steam line. A British rail crane arriving from Carlisle was to tackle the removal of the turntable for transfer to Keithley. Although the bare turntable only weighs about 16 tons, the crane had limited access from the main running line and the lifting was a very delicate operation. The jib had to carry out the lift at full stretch. moments as the crane operator receives his instructions from the foreman. Careful transfer to the rail wagon concluded the successful operation. Today, the snow is gone and Garsdale has been left in peace. The quiet and remote valley of Garsdale is served by a profusion of chapels and churches. These date from a time when Garsdale was one of the most powerful centers of Methodism in the Dales. Further down the valley, the scenery is equally pleasing with wild horses grazing in the shadow of the Howgill Fells. Before we leave Garsdale, there is time for refreshment at the Moorcock Inn before the final pull to the top of the long drag.
Ayes Gill is the highest point of the Settle and Carlisle line and the source of the River Eden, which we can now follow all the way to Carlisle. Aysgill Moor cottages, built by the Midland Railway for their workers, now provide refreshments for passers-by. Right next to the railway line, a magnificent waterfall tumbles down Hell Gill from the fells above. From A's Gill, the line runs down to Malastang and beneath the shadow of Wild Boar Fell. Malastang is a wild and beautiful valley. Hemmed in by dark and brooding ridges, it is remote enough to be ignored by the crowds who flock to the lakes and bays. One attraction not to be missed is the North of England Falconry and Conservation Centre. Here are many different species of hawks, buzzards, owls, falcons and eagles and you'll also be able to see them fly. It's a hawk, Thanks, because uh, sparrow hawks tend to, uh, they haunt near the head. Well, it's just in case he uh, happens to fly with the milk here. In the shows. He's had a fortnight's training with a young lad who was here on a course. So he's, he's in the early stages and we don't actually at the moment let anybody else hold him. But he's, he's rather lovely. Uh, he's got, I'm going to try and show you his legs. Beautiful tan colour. And lovely cream on mm -hmm. the end to his white at the end of his tail. It's rather nice. <laughs> yeah, the, the difference between the, the hawks, which is a good example of a hawk, is this enormous spread of wing, which is very wide that way. And it's short and wide. And whereas the falcons are so much longer tails. Yeah. Yes, you see the difference. And uh, the falcons are what we call the long wing. So here's a good example of a short wing. They're watching you like a hawk. I mean, you can see, he watches yeah. absolutely everything. <laughs> yeah, not going <coughs> through, sorry. He's about ready to hunt. It's just that it's, at the moment he's not quite keen enough. He uh, goes after the rabbits, but at the last minute, chickens out, doesn't put his feet down to catch the rabbit. But uh, once he's caught his first rabbit, he'll be aware. Yeah. And apparently in the wild of the beak, and they'll pack loads and loads of food, and yeah. you'll see it sometimes. Yeah. I'll show you, he's got quite quite a wingspan. <laughs> and yeah, it's very light under the wings. Yeah. And all this soft feathering is... Further down the valley, Thrang Bridge crosses the Infant River Eden. It's the perfect spot to wait for a glimpse of the occasional steam train.
just a mile or so further on, and we come to Pendragon Castle. The ruins date from Norman times, and the site may even have Celtic origins. Legend has it that King Arthur was born here. A few minutes later, the train pulls into Kirby Stephen, where the tight confines of Malastang open out into the wide Eden Valley. Kirby Stephen is a handsome old market town, once famous for its fairs, markets, and numerous pubs. Next to the cobbled market square are the cloisters, built in 1810, when the practice of bull baiting was still a common sight in these parts. The rules of the butter market, which was held in the cloisters, are still displayed. Through the cloisters is the parish church. Its size has earned it the title Cathedral of the Dales. At Sten Crith, just a short walk from the town, the river Eden plunges through a rocky gorge, and the shade of the trees makes this the perfect spot for a hot afternoon. On the other side of the town, the scenery is quite different as we look up at the Smardale Viaduct. Crossing the Skendal back, as well as the disused Tabay Railway, this is the tallest viaduct on the line. Approaching Appleby, the old county town of Westmoreland, we find the delightful hamlet of Great Ormside. A prominent feature is a sycamore tree surrounded by stone steps, once the site of a regular cheese and butter market. Nearby is the church of St. James, which looks down on the village from a grassy knoll. From here, we can also get a fine view of the Ormside Viaduct. It carries the Settle and Carlisle line over the River Eden into Appleby. With the boundary changes of 1974, Westmoreland was absorbed by Cumbria and Appleby ceased to be a county town, but it has lost none of its original charm and character. Barrogate is the town's main street and marketplace, and at its base stands St. Lawrence's, a fine early English church which dates from Norman times. The high cross at the head of Barragate 
is said to have been erected by Jack Robinson, an 18th century member of parliament whose name coined a well-known expression. But the biggest attraction in Appleby is its castle. Lady Anne Clifford, who lived here in the 17th century, regarded Appleby as the favorite of all her six castles, and it is not difficult to see why. Set on a landscaped hilltop, this is considered to be the best preserved Norman keep in Britain. Opposite the keep is the Great Hall, home of the Clifford family for nearly 700 years, and now a training and conference centre. Visitors are still able to see the great triptych depicting the life of Lady Anne Clifford. In the cabinet below, there is a Chinese porcelain dinner service which was part of the Nanking cargo salvaged from the South China Sea in 1986. The grounds of the castle are a center for the Rare Breed Survival Trust and support a large collection of rare breeds of domestic farm animals, birds, waterfowl and poultry. The trust works to ensure that no more breeds become extinct and to preserve the widest possible range of animal characteristics. North of Appleby, the high fells of the Lake District come into view as the Eden Valley broadens into a wide and fertile plain. Our next stop along the line is at Langwethby, a charming little village with houses clustered around the green where the pace of life is as measured as it ever was.
Equally pleasant is the nearby village of Little Salkeld, with its fascinating working water mill. The mill's been on this site for 200 years, and it is a traditional working water mill. We have two water wheels that power the mill, and all the machinery inside the mill is as it was. We've been here for 20 years producing organic stone ground flour using all the traditional machinery in the mill with a few additions, namely some augers. We, use, we have two water wheels here, a great big one that we use for doing the milling with and a smaller one that we use for auxiliary equipment. a very scrummy lunch or coffee and of course all the baking is made with our flour and we do a big variety of flour so there's lots of different things to have a try of. Just above Little Salkeld stands Long Meg and her daughters, a stone circle over 6,000 years old and every bit as atmospheric as Stonehenge. Following the road from Langwathby up over the long Pennine Ridge, we arrive in Alston, England's highest market town and home of the South Tyndale Railway. The old branch line was relayed and opened in 1983. It now claims to be England's highest narrow gauge railway. Returning to Langwathby, the splendid panorama of the Eden Valley spreads out below us. Before rejoining the Settle and Carlisle Railway, there's time for a brief visit to Acorn Bank. The gardens here are owned and protected by the National Trust. They're renowned for their extensive collection of medicinal and culinary herbs. Nearly 250 species are accommodated in three long borders which cater for a variety of conditions. is divided by an avenue of yew and within the shelter of the 17th century walls shrubs and herbaceous plants flourish.
north now to Lazenby, an ideal centre where we can explore some of the hidden gems of the Eden Valley. Walk south along the banks of the river and you'll soon come to Lacey's Caves. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Lacey had these chambers hewn out of the sandstone cliff as an exercise in 18th century romantic landscaping. To complement this extravagance, it is said that a hermit was employed to give the caves an authentic appearance. Just as much effort was put into the creation of the nunnery walks. These footpaths and ledges beside the turbulent Crogling Gorge also date from the 1700s. Since then, this rocky gorge has become famous for giving a wonderful insight into nature in the raw. Above the gorge, a reinstated pond is home to insects, newts and snails. Nearing Carlisle now, there is time for one final stop at Armorthwaite. This quiet village is surrounded by hills and woods and has more than its fair share of skilled artists and craftsmen. Near the edge of the village, a little sandstone church is built neatly into the hillside, while the bridge over the Eden gives magnificent views of the river and castle. We've now reached the end of our journey. We arrive in the imposing border city of Carlisle. Carlisle has had a long and turbulent history. Attacked and occupied by Romans, Danes, English and Scots, it was besieged as late as 1745 and remained a fortified city into the early years of the last century. These enormous drum-shaped towers are known as the Citadel. At the end of Backhouse Walk, there is a fine stretch of the city wall. Built in the 11th century, it has been repeatedly repaired ever since. Anyone looking for history in Carlisle will not need to go far, but Tully House Museum and its exhibitions explains it all. The grounds are filled with Roman remains and provide the perfect setting for a snack or lunch. Carlisle Castle was begun by Henry I of England and completed by David of Scotland, who regarded Carlisle as his southern capital. It now houses the museum of the King's own royal regiment. A 
encircled by walls, citadels and castles, are the quaint streets and alleys of old Carlisle. In the centre of the city stands the Market Cross, now the focus for an award-winning shopping centre which has been skilfully blended with its surroundings. Pride of place must go to the cathedral, the cathedral church of the holy and undivided trinity, more than lives up to its name. It dates from Norman times and volunteer guides are usually on hand to show you round and answer questions. Particularly outstanding features are the vaulting, the stained glass and the painted ceiling. It has been an incredible journey, and what better way to return home than by steam train. So, we board the great Marquis for the run back down the line to settle. 